What's the real story? How did all of this come to be? Was it all by chance, or did something or someone design everything? Join us as we learn from our host, William Henry, and discover that the story of the Earth and our universe is really his story. Welcome to Discovering His Story, a production of Youngstown Christian Television. In Discovering His Story, we seek to integrate the Bible record with secular history record and see where the two intersect and what influence they have upon one another. We hope thereby to not only understand the Bible better, but also to give us more confidence in the biblical record itself, knowing that it is the Word of God and that it is accurate. Well, we are in the time period that we call ancient times. Uh, we started at the beginning of time, have gone through a number of the different civilizations, and uh, we are in the midst of looking at ancient Egypt at the present time. In ancient Egypt, we have uh, spent time looking at the three major time periods of ancient Egypt, the Old Kingdom period, the Middle Kingdom period, and we are now in the New Kingdom period. It's during the New Kingdom period uh, that we come across the exodus from Egypt of the Israelites led by Moses. Uh, by the way, uh, there are some who criticize uh, this event as not having taken place because there is no record of it in Egyptian history, in the Egyptian records themselves. Well, that's easily explained. Uh, there is no civilization that records their losses. In fact, there are some battles in which the losing king erects a stele that indicates that he won. Uh, so they try to put the best spin on everything. And uh, so uh, there's, it's not a surprise that uh, the Exodus is not mentioned in Egyptian history itself. So we're looking at, uh, we were looking at the plagues last time, and we came to the 10th plague, and I wanted to at least mention uh, what occurred concerning that plague in relationship to the Israelites. And that is, of course, what we call Passover. Uh, the Israelites were told to kill a lamb uh, and to apply the blood of that lamb using a hyssop branch on the doorpost, uh, on the side, and on, on the top. And uh, they were to gather then together as a family, uh, meeting together uh, around a meal with this lamb and some other items that we'll look at. And that uh, seeing the blood on the door, that the angel of death would pass over the Israelite families and uh, in his rounds to uh, bring death to the firstborn of all animals and mankind throughout the land of Egypt as a final sign to Pharaoh uh, that Yahweh was a more powerful God than he or any of the gods of Egypt. Uh, as a part of the Passover Seder that developed uh, after that time in remembrance of uh, the Passover meal, uh, there are different elements that are there. Uh, and I'm not going to go into detail with uh, the elements that we find in the Passover meal uh, that is celebrated today and has been for hundreds of years or thousands of years. Uh, so I invite you to, uh, if you have a chance, go to a Seder celebration or you can look on line on YouTube and find uh, a number of different people that have uh, explained this very adequately, uh, better than I can. Uh, but it's very interesting and I do encourage you to do so because there are some distinctive indications um, of the Messiah in the Passover Seder meal. And so uh, very, very important and very instructive. But we're going to pass on from that to uh, the next <clears throat> question under consideration, and that is, uh, where did the Israelites go after they left Egypt? Uh, now, there's, there have been a lot of different uh, considerations uh, as to the, the route that was taken. Uh, this is the one that's normally uh, 
believed to be the, the route taken. You can see where they cross the, the, the Red Sea on the left there, going into the Sinai Peninsula down to Mount Sinai and beyond. Uh, some have uh, said that because it should be translated Reed Sea instead of Red Sea, that uh, the, tra the uh, crossing took place further north in an area of marshes. Uh, but of course, that presents problems. If that's where the, uh, the well, crossing the Red Sea took place, uh, how did Pharaoh and all his, or how did, how did all the chariots of, of Pharaoh uh, and his army drown in just you know, a few inches of water? Uh, that's sort of untenable. Uh, but in order to, to uh, find what route they took, it's important for us to understand where Mount Sinai was located. And we're going to do that. Now, in the early 3rd century AD, monastic hermitage communities in the southern Sinai Peninsula birthed the idea that Mount Sinai was in their vicinity. Uh, this tradition was aided by Helena, the mother of Constantine the Great, who founded a chapel there in AD 330. Uh, Constantine, remember, was the uh, emperor who's considered the first Christian emperor and who legalized Christianity. And his mother did a great deal to preserve many of the biblical sites uh, by building churches on them. Uh, and this is one place where she was told this was Mount Sinai, and so um, she built a structure there a chapel. Uh, subsequent growth of religious pilgrimage to Jebel Musa, as it is now called, um, cemented this tradition of, uh, that's found in Christendom and in Judaism. Uh, but it's interesting that there's been no archaeological evidence of the exodus that's ever been found on the Sinai Peninsula, uh, despite an intensive 12-year Israeli survey completed in 1982. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is not where the Israelites went, uh, because there are a lot of things in history that are not necessarily found in uh, artifacts. But it certainly gives us pause, and uh, we'll consider uh, what that pause will lead to. But first, I want to take you to this particular location. Uh, this is the Sinai Desert, which is... Uh, in that southern part of the Sinai Peninsula, you can see what a, a vast wasteland it is, rocky, nothing growing at all. Here are a few shrubs uh, growing in uh, the Sinai Desert. You can see the mountains behind. If you travel there, um, uh, you have a choice of motels in which to stay, uh, which is limited to one. Uh, this is the Morganland room. This is a patio off of the room in which we stayed. Um, it looks like <clears throat> this was built in the 70s, 1970s, and uh, hasn't been updated <laughs> since. Uh, maybe they've done some work since we've been there. I don't know. Uh, there's a nice pool there, uh, which um, my wife used uh, while I was uh, off hiking, as we'll see in a few minutes. Uh, I think they did see a, a snake swimming in it, and that kind of emptied the pool of the few that were there. Uh, I thought this was a, an interesting shot as we're uh, standing around Morganland. Uh, I saw what looked to me like a guardian in the distance at the edge of the mountain. Do you see him there on the right-hand side of the, uh, the mountains, the mountain peaks there? Here's a close-up look, and uh, he looks like a, a guardian from science fiction, some kind of a soldier, doesn't he? Well, located there at the base of Mount Sinai is St. Catherine's Monastery. Uh, this was a monastery that was built um, uh, after Helena uh, had visited there, and uh, this the monastery was established. Uh, it's a very important monastery historically, as well as for uh, monks that might go there. And again, you can see some of the mountainside behind it there, uh, more so on this picture. Uh, it's right up next to the mountains. Now, one of the main reasons why St. Catherine's Monastery is important is not just because it's located at the base of Mount Sinai, but because of what was discovered there. And I won't go into a lot of detail now. We'll probably talk about it sometime later when we get to this place in history. But uh, Dr. Tischendorf was in the area 
and was uh, staying at the monastery. By the way, you can visit the monastery and depending on what day you're there, you may be able to go inside and view uh, some of the uh, artifacts that are there, some of the uh, parchments, the scrolls that are there. But uh, Tischendorf was there and uh, found that uh, some of the materials he was given to build a fire uh, were actually ancient scrolls. <laughs> and as he examined them, he found that they were scrolls of Scripture. And uh, so he was able to smuggle some of them out. Um, over time, was, was able to put together uh, what is called uh, Codex Sinaiticus, uh, which is uh, one of the most ancient scrolls of the New Testament. Very important find for the study of the New Testament uh, in Greek. Uh, and this was where that took place. Uh, if you're there, you might want to take advantage of using the water closet that's outside the monastery. Now here's a, a drawing of a map of the area. Uh, you can see that as you're down at the bottom of the map, there's a, the taxi stand you can see. Uh, opposite that are, is a water closet and there's the monastery. Uh, spelled differently in this particular map. Uh, and that's where you pick up the camels. Now, if you want to climb Mount Sinai, uh, you can take uh, what's called the Stairs of Repentance, um, which is a long, long climb, but uh, most people advise that you go by camel. And you can see the camel path there on the bottom, uh, circling along to the left, and then zigzagging up the mountainside until you get to, oh, to pass where it says cutting. And there you see stairs again. And from that point, you can climb, oh, I forget now, I think it was 900 and some stairs that you can climb to the top of Mount Sinai. That's the only way you can get there. Now, these are not normal stairs, as we'll see in a few minutes. These are rocks that were kind of pushed into place to provide a, a kind of stairway. Uh, and a rather arduous journey. But uh, I found that the journey on Camelback was, was no less arduous. Uh, here we are going up the Camel Pathway, going up Sinai. It begins behind the monastery. And here, uh, Bedouin cameleers offer rides up Mount Sinai, uh, stopping just short of what's called Elijah's Basin. You remember that Elijah uh, also went to Mount Sinai, and so they have speculated as to where he may have gone exactly. Um, and, uh, okay, I see I have my notes here. Uh, uh, 750 steps it was, not 900, uh, but 750. It felt more like 900. All right, um, here's another shot of uh, my camel as I'm riding, going up following the camel ahead of me. Uh, as you're riding, you can look ahead and see uh, the camel's that are in the caravan before you because it zigzags back and forth. And so here we are looking at the camels that are ahead. And uh, uh, here's another shot of camels that are ahead of us. And I know that they are a long ways away. And uh, the problem I was having is that the, the, the saddle uh, on which I was riding was very small. And it wasn't a nice Western saddle uh, like you see on horses, uh, or even as you see on a lot of camel rides. Uh, this saddle had a, a board sticking up in the front and a board sticking up in the back. The board in the back was, was cutting in against my back, and the board in the front, the, the saddle was so small that it was pushing up against my belly. Um, as you probably can tell, my belly sticks out a little bit. It was extremely uncomfortable. But the worst part was that I couldn't find a place to put my legs. Now, thinner people are able to cross their legs in front and you know, ride that way. But my legs were sticking straight out from the camel uh, with no way to relax them. They, they, I couldn't let them go down. And so as I rode along, my, my thigh muscles began to cramp from holding my legs up. And so I tried to shift from one side to the other to give one leg a rest and the other leg a rest, and that just was not working. I rode along, and you know, I'm the kind of person that doesn't like to give up. I, you know, there's a challenge, I'm gonna to try to meet it, and I wasn't going to 
not make it up Mount Sinai. But I, I looked ahead at these camels that were going ahead of me and uh, saw how far much further it was before we got to the disembarkment from the camels. I finally realized I'm just not going to make it. So I told the camel driver I need to get off and he, he was surprised. Um, and so he, he uh, told the camel to, to kneel down. All right, so now I've got another problem. In order to lift my leg up over the camel seat, what muscle do I use? <laughs> the thigh muscle. It's not working, it's cramped. Somehow I was able to, I had long pants on, I was able to grab my pant leg and lift my leg up over and slide off the camel. All right, so now I've got to walk the rest of the way where people are riding camels up to the point where we are climbing the stairs. Well, I decided why walk the path when it's zigzagging, I can just cut, cut across cross country. Um, it was steep but, and rocky, but I thought, well, I can do that. Well, I don't know if it was the heat, it was about 120 degrees, uh, or whether it was the, uh, the elevation, but my lungs were not in agreement with climbing that far, that fast. And so I had to slow down my pace and climbed up, was able to finally do it, passing by holes in the ground every once in a while, hoping nothing would come out at me. Finally made it up to uh, where the, uh, the camel path was ending. Uh, and it was interesting, along the way, the, the Bedouins there have a little store, little shacks selling stuff. Um, you know, if you, you need something to eat, they've got candy bars, if you need more water. And even though I had packed several quarts of water in my backpack, I went through those pretty quickly and I, I bought some from them and they, they didn't overcharge. That was nice. One thing I found that was very interesting is one of the things they were selling was a souvenir and it was rock from Mount Sinai. Okay, I'm looking around. There are rocks all around. <laughs> Why would I buy a rock when I just pick up a rock off the ground? It's the same thing. So, rather curious. But I found that these Bedouins would uh, um, stay up there with all their, the things they were selling and uh, you know, go back at night. And it was quite a climb, but they would do it or ride camels, I suppose. But uh, here's the view from uh, Sinai looking uh, down upon the area. And uh, here's what I saw at one point riding the camels. These guys are way out ahead of me. And then we got to the steps. So these are the steps we had to climb. Again, my thigh muscles are cramped. That's what you use to lift up your legs to climb steps. So uh, at least for a while, <clears throat> I'm grabbing my pant legs. I'm glad I wore long pants so I had something to grab onto. And each step I was taking, I was grabbing a pant leg, lifting it up to that step, grabbing the other pant leg, lifting it up to the next step. Uh, it was difficult. Uh, after a while, the muscles kind of limbered up a little bit and I was able to climb more steadily. But it, it was difficult climbing. Our guide stopped every 50 steps to give us a rest. And those 50 steps seemed like 100 as we were climbing up uh, towards the summit of Mount Sinai. And we have a satellite image uh, which shows this area. Take a look here at the screen and we'll see that um, how mountainous it is around that area and how really one mountain blends into the next so that in reality we started out near uh, St. Catherine's Monastery down here on the left and you can see the trail going up uh, to the left uh, up around the mountain. We're actually on uh, a different mountain than what's called Mount Sinai and have to cross over to the mountain itself. Um, you can see what rugged terrain that is and uh, uh, very, very hot as well, uh, the time of year I was there. Uh, so, much, so much so that even though I drank, I don't know how many quarts of water, gallons of water, uh, um, I never had to relieve myself, it just all sweated out. And so finally we find ourselves up there on the top of Mount Sinai, and uh, what a wonderful view it was up there, uh, but very difficult to get there, at least from my perspective. Now, if I'd been 30 years younger, it probably would have been no problem. 
Uh, we had a Navy SEAL with us that was running up and down uh, along with the, uh, the guide that we had. So um, that's how it looks from the air, and here's how it looked from uh, where I was. Uh, you can see some of the scenery of uh, Sinai there. Uh, that's looking down at um, uh, some buildings down below. Uh, I think it's a, maybe another monastery, I'm not sure. Um, here we're looking at uh, camels in the distance, like the silhouette that they gave to, uh, to us from the sky. And then here we come to the 750 steps that we had to climb. You can see that they're, they're good steps, um, not, not uniform in height. Uh, most of them are, are kind of tall, but uh, you have to watch yourself too because they, they're, they're uneven. Uh, they've been there for centuries and centuries, and you have to watch your step. You, know, you don't want to step over to the side, uh, which again it presents a, a problem when you're coming down if you come down at night. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. Uh, here's uh, some more shots from uh, on the way up Mount Sinai. Uh, we would take a break every once in a while. Every 50 steps, our guide told us we could rest for a few minutes. It seemed like 100 steps. Uh, I was counting. Oh no, it's, we're only on 39. Um, uh, and of course, I was having to pull my pant legs up each each step because my thigh muscles were cramped and pull my leg up for one step and the next step. And, um, it, but eventually the muscles kind of loosened up a little bit and I was able to climb the steps, but uh, it, it still was difficult. Here's another shot from up there. Just even though it's barren, it still has its own beauty in the, the rocks, the colors of the rocks that we see. Um, here's another shot on top. We finally made it to the top, uh, looking out over the the, uh, the landscape, uh, and here I am uh, before the beard on top. That was, that was after a 30-minute rest of me just sitting. <laughs> I couldn't stand. Once I got up there, I just had to sit for about 30 minutes before I had the strength to stand for a picture. Um, here's another view. I wasn't too sure about that location because I was sitting on a camel blank. I wasn't sure what insects there might be in there, but uh, one of my friends wanted to take a picture there, so we did that. And at the very top there is a chapel. Uh, it was not open to us at the time. I don't know if it is other times. And there's also a, um, a small Muslim, I'm not, I don't think it was a mosque, but a, a small Muslim building as well because they revere that site also. Uh, and then we were going to climb down. Uh, we were, had all looked all around, our, our group had looked all around the, the, uh, the edges and had uh, seen all the scenery and we were just kind of sitting there waiting. And one of the people in our group said, uh, to, said to the, the guide, what do we do now? And he said, well, a lot of people like to just kind of pray and meditate and all that. Well, being, I think we're all of one mind there. We can, I mean, it's a nice place maybe, but it's nothing special as far as talking with God there and as any other place. And so uh, we said, eh, we don't really need to do that. And he said, well, most people wait until sunset to see the sun going down and then go down in the dark. And we thought, mm, that doesn't sound like a good idea. <laughs> uh, even though we had rented flashlights from Morganland, but we decided to head down while it was still light. And I'm so glad we did because we got most of the steps done while we could still see. So this is on the climb down. And as we went down the steps, we found that they were sometimes slippery, um, especially if any camels had been there or donkeys. I guess, more, I guess donkeys would climb up there bringing supplies. Uh, because uh, they, as they uh, would leave their droppings behind, eventually they would turn to dust. And so it was slippery. You had to watch your step. And then as we got down off the steps, it got dark. got dark very quickly. And it was dark as dark could be. You could not see anything. The flashlight I had, I could barely see my feet. 
So I couldn't see very far in front of me. So we gathered together and uh, to some groups of using our flashlights so that we could see a little bit, uh, but you couldn't see more than a couple feet in front of you. Uh, and you know how it is when you're, when you're walking a distance, it's helpful to, to look at a landmark and see that's where I'm headed so I, can, I know how far to go, but there wasn't anything. There were no lights anywhere. Uh, we could not see anything. All we could see was the path before us. Every once in a while we heard some noises of people coming up on Camelback, and so we had to move off to the side to allow the camels going up uh, as people were taking a nighttime camel ride up to the summit of Mount Sinai. But other than that, we didn't see anything. And as we're traveling along, plodding along, <laughs> step by step, step by step, step by step, suddenly as I'm walking, I look to my left and I saw a building and I recognize it, it is St. Catherine's. We're almost there. And so we went a little further across a parking lot and into the area of the motel. Uh, a friend of mine and I, uh, a friend that I had made uh, on this trip, we went into the restaurant there to refresh ourselves. And my wife and his wife had been waiting there. And uh, they told us that we looked like death warmed over. <laughs> we were so exhausted and worn out. So we went in, <laughs> drank some water, I'm sure, and uh, slept very soundly that night. Uh, so that was my experience on Mount Sinai. Now I want you to look at a topographical map and you can see that uh, Mount Sinai down there in the bottom tip of the Sinai Peninsula is a very mountainous area. And I want you to keep that in mind, and especially what I said about the mountains kind of running into each other, uh, because that presents a bit of an issue when we think about the location of the real Mount Sinai. Uh, I've done a lot of reading and studying in the past uh, decade or so uh, as I've come across materials that talk about uh, another possible location for Mount Sinai. Uh, and and in order to determine the route of the Exodus, I think we need to know where were they going? Where was the Mount Sinai to which they were headed? Was it this one in the southern peninsula of Sinai? In that case, then uh, we can see that the route probably would have gone along the coast of the Red Sea until they got down to that point. However, if Mount Sinai is indeed in another location, that is going to affect what we think is the route that was taken by Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt to the place where he had seen the burning bush, where Yahweh had appeared to him in that burning bush and spoken to him and told him that he was to go to Egypt and lead the children of Israel out of slavery in that land. And it is there that he revealed himself to Moses as Yahweh. I am that I am. And it's by that name that Moses, remember, went to Pharaoh, Amenhotep II, and said that Yahweh wants his people to come out of Egypt. And Amenhotep II replied, Who is this Yahweh? I never heard of him. Well, it's very important that we understand the location of Mount Sinai because that's where that occurred. And then subsequently, when the children of Israel get there, having exited Egypt, it is where they receive the commandments. It's where they receive the law that's given to Moses. So it's an extremely important location. And I think we're going to see next time that the route they took is important as well and helps, to, helps us to understand what occurred in the miracles that took place and in understanding how they got there. We'll see you next time on Discovering His Story. Join us as we learn from our host, William Henry, and discover that the story of the earth and our universe is really his story.